Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Can you be a little louder, uh, Stinivas? Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Is it, is it loud? Loud enough? Yes, loud. Okay, great. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, at the outset, let me thank Sri Harsha for his selfless uh, initiative, uh, which is a non-pharma-based webinar series. I'm uh, very touched by uh, his gesture, and I think his primary aim is to spread awareness and knowledge. Uh, Mentally, actually, uh, came up with this. Uh, I was very impressed. Um, and uh, thank you very much, Harsha, and really grateful for what you're doing for, uh, for everybody. And uh, thanks, Sagar. Thanks for uh, uh, setting up this stage. And uh, let me just start with my presentation. So as uh, Sagar beautifully has put it, what we're basically going to do is we're going to introduce the technology to you first, talk to you about a little bit of physics behind the entire publishing technology, because we need to know what we are doing and why we are doing it, and what goes on in that machine and in the wand that we use when we do publishing-assisted surgeries. Uh, let me also say that it's just not about the tool. Uh, both me and Sagar, this we have absolutely no financial disclosures for this particular event. Smith and Nephew has not paid us for this presentation. Uh, this is purely a, a, a non-commercial uh, initiative. Uh, this is out of just pure love to the technology. So. Let me just share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, Srinivas. Yes. All right. So the title of the first presentation that I'm going to make to you is Publication, Everything You Need to Know. When the first uh, time the, uh, there, then it was OrthroCare, the OrthroCare representative first came in and spoke to us about uh, publication. And when he told me and introduced me about publication, I thought cold, publication means cold ablation because they're talking everything about cold and it being a lower, a lower temperature compared to laser and all that. But uh, then I learned that uh, Publation is nothing but controlled ablation. So what does it basically involve? Publation basically involves creation of what we call as a glow discharge plasma. This glow discharge plasma is something that all of us see when we use the coblation wand. You get the orange glow. The orange glow basically comes from the ionized sodium uh, ions. Uh, so when electricity flows through a conducting medium like sodium chloride, the uh, ions get dissociated and this is the exact glow, the orange glow is what you get below a sodium vapor street lamp, telling us that it is the sodium vapor, it's the sodium that is giving the glow. So if you were to give uh, some potassium rich uh, 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 instead of uh, medium, instead of saline, you would get uh, a violet or a purple glow. But another interesting thing that I would like to share with you friends is that coblation is not a thermal process. It's actually a chemical process. And this glow discharge plasma that we talk about is about 100 to 200 microns. So it basically helps us to remove or by layer by layer and what we call as precise volume reduction. The one that we use when we are using it in tongue base or when you are using it for lingual tonsils, it is this precise volume reduction that we really uh, enjoy when we use coblation. But Coblation is just not about volume reduction, as you will see in the, uh, in the coming presentations that uh, both of us have. The other important point is that it does have very minimal thermal damage to 
untargeted tissue. What does that mean? It basically means that there is no collateral damage happening. That means the tissues just adjacent to the area that you have created a lesion with cobulation has almost no effect at all. Now, this is a small uh, slide and I'm sure most of you would have seen it. So it is important to recognize that plasma is a state of matter as equal as solid, liquid, and gas. An ionized gas is called plasma, and this is exactly what we use when we talk about cobulation. So if we break down the wand that we use, because the wand is, the, uh, is, is ultimately the device that you're using. So I'll spend about a few minutes on this. So uh, these are the active electrodes. And the saline comes from here. And the moment the saline comes and reaches this part, the radio frequency energy, which is being generated by the console, comes here, comes in contact with the plasma, with the, with the electrodes, and you start developing the plasma. And this plasma is what we use when we do oblation surgery. So what does this diagram tell you? It basically tells you that you're using plasma to do your procedure and hence cobulation, dear friends, is a non-touch technique. And that is the reason why there is a learning curve when you do cobulation surgeries. Because everything that we've used, let it be a micro depredator, let it be a monopolar diathermy or a laser or whatever, they are all touch driven processes. Whereas this is a non-touch and is a plasma-driven process. So it takes time for us to learn. But the learning curve is not steep at all. It's very easy to get onto that curve and achieve the numbers that uh, most of us achieve. So pay attention to this particular stages of plasma generation. I think this is a very, very important thing, even though the slide looks very busy. It is important that we understand what, is, what, does, what does plasma generation involve? There are actually five stages in the plasma generation. The first phase is called the vapor stage of vapor gas piston formation. This is characterized by transition from bubble to film boiling. Now this decreases the heat emission. So this is very important. Now the second stage called the stage of vapor film pulsation. Tissue ablation actually happens in this stage. In the third stage, there is reduction of amplitude of current across the electrodes. And this is done by the console itself. Now, why is this very important? The fourth stage and fifth stage basically are respectively dissipation of electron energy. And fifth stage is the stage of thermal dissipation. Now, why is it important that we learn these stages? It's important we learn these stages because the actual pulsation, the actual tissue ablation is happening in stage two. So when you are using the coblation, you have to go on the yellow pedal, on, off, on, off, because if you continuously keep pressing it, there is a reduction of amplitude of current across the electrodes and you are not generating a very good plasma field. So that is why when anybody teaches you cobulation, they tell you to go on and off, on and off, because you can get this second stage again and again and again so that you can develop very good plasma. Now, this is another way of describing the same thing. So this is the wand, electric path, voltage from the controller. When they say controller, you're talking about the, the console, the generator, and the plasma field. So we're in the tissue uh, breakdown and byproducts are light and low heat. Now, how does cobulation work? So once all that energy is generated at the tip of your wand, the plasma that is generated actually breaks the covalent bonds between protein molecules, and that's how cobulation is executed. 
Just for kick's sake, I thought I'll just put in a little bit of uh, history. Publation is actually a brainchild of uh, uh, Mr. Hira Taplial, okay, and Philip Eggers. Hira Taplial is a very Indian sounding name. Yes, it is an Indian. So is money in ENT? No, money is in cardiology and orthopedics, and that's how they started it, actually. This was actually a, a, a fluke discovery, and they actually thought that they could use this technology to unblock coronary arteries. But unfortunately, they had disasters on the table because coblation punctured holes into the, into the arteries, and they had to, unfortunately, stop that procedure. Then... They started trying it in, in orthopedics. They still do quite well in orthopedics and shoulder and all that. Uh, but since their uh, inception into orthopedics, they started uh, making huge waves. And two of them started this company called Orthrocare. Orthrocare has later been sold to uh, Smith & Nephew and now Publation is under the banner of uh, Smith & Nephew. So all of us need to be proud that, uh, you know, Kublation is a brainchild of, uh, of an Indian. This is the U.S. Uh, patent of um, Taplial. Mr. Taplial is still there. He is, uh, but he's in another avatar nowadays. Um, he does um, biotechnology and things like that. So a few words on the generator. This is the current one. It's called the Kublator, Gen uh, Kublator 2. The new uh, coblator, the third generation, is probably going to come by the mid. Uh, it would have come by now by the American Academy meeting, but unfortunately, I think because of all the COVID, even though the meeting is there, um, they probably are not going to release the third version. So quickly, you need to know that uh, this is a radio frequency device, ultimately, and it has a microprocessor in it. The generator is capable of adjusting, as you all know, uh, based on the wand that you put in. It gets, uh, because of the microprocessor, it recognizes the wand and automatically goes into the, uh, the settings, the preset settings that are ideal for that particular um, wand. There is coblation and cauterization. This is a, a little more uh, uh, physics information, which I don't think we need to do. The wand, again, is the, if, if uh, the console is the heart, the wand is the soul. This is how it, uh, uh, this is through which the plasma is produced. And uh, this is basically made of ceramic. And these are the electrodes that are made of tungsten. Uh, a lot of companies have actually uh, come up with, as you all know, multiple uh, devices, but nobody has been able to sort of bring in the, the kind of finesse and the thickness of the electrodes exactly to, the, uh, uh, to, this, uh, to this level that Smith & Nephew has been able to achieve. Well, this is my uh, take on it. So there are two modes. There is ablation mode and, and uh, coblation mode. And as we do the surgeries, you'd be able to um, see where, how we would use most of these uh, modes. But always, always ablation mode is, if you really want to use coblation, it's the ablation mode. Don't try and use the coblation or uh, coagulation mode because if you really want to look at the, uh, uh, the thermal damage, if you look at it in the coagulation mode, the uh, coagulation mode, the temperature is much higher. And in ablation mode, the temperature is much lower. And this is the depth based on the settings. So this is uh, blue denotes uh, coblation depth. And as you start increasing, you can really see the depth of uh, the, uh, uh, the lesion that you would create. And if you look at the collateral damage, that is the thermal depth, it just starts keep going down. The take home message from this slide is that if you think that you are operating on a child, or if you are thinking that it's a nose, you want to use less, if you put the setting on six or five, you are obviously not going to get good results in terms of the, uh, the lesion that you would create. It's only from seven onwards that you will start getting good uh, uh, coagulation lesion formation. 
So from here, I don't. Uh, I would like to stop my presentation and ask Sagar to take over, and then I will come back and uh, join with you guys. Uh, Sagar, Stinuous, uh, yeah, Stinuous, uh, Do you want to show the wands? Meet the wands. You want to show them real quickly because I am not showing them anywhere. That's a that's a total. Uh, I think. Uh, no, need to show. That, uh, okay. no, I think okay. it is important when we have time. We will show Sagar. I think uh, yeah. we are running out of time because um, we'll uh, miss Harsha the actual also, stuff. No, yes, and also Harsha also has another presentation uh, after, after this. this. Okay. Yes. So thank you, Dr. Sinewas, for setting up the stage. Uh, it was. Um, I'll just. Uh, Srinivas, are you able to see my slide? Yes, Hello. You can see, sir. You can proceed. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, so far, what uh, Dr. Srinivas did was he did the introduction of uh, cobblation technology. So, I think um, he has told us what is a, a generator, what are the types of wands we have. And uh, he has also mentioned uh, about uh, um, the thermal damage, what can happen and what is the uh, amount of heat energy that is generated by cobblation. Now, uh, as uh, Dr. Srinivas has mentioned before, we both have no financial disclosure to make in regards to this presentation. Um, we want to make it clear because we are not sponsored by any company to do this talk. As uh, Dr. Srinivas mentioned before, we are just doing this so that uh, you as the uh, delegates or ENT surgeons can choose this tool whenever you are faced with uh, any special situations. I think you all would know um, that cobblation is very useful in tonsils and adenoids. But I think uh, we are going to talk a little bit more than the application in tonsils and adenoids. So uh, my first topic is going to be cobblation in ANT, a potpourri. So uh, the first topic or the first uh, scenario that I'm going to choose is the one Srinivas, are you able to see this? Sorry. The slide is not showing up for me. No, no, it's very clear. One second, one second. I'll just. So is that clear now? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. It is clear. Okay, so good. So, uh, so this is a child who had come to us with the respiratory distress and um, this child was just a day old. And when the child was seen by the pediatrician, this, the child was in severe respiratory distress. And uh, immediately they intubated the child and they called me. When I went and examined, I saw a huge cystic lesion that was arising from the lateral pharyngeal wall on the right side. So uh, I thought that it is a regular pharyngeal cyst or, uh, and we were planning to go for the imaging. But since the child was already intubated and already was in ICU, and since the patient was uh, 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 belonging to a low socioeconomic status, uh, the pediatrician uh, spoke to the parents and then spoke to me and then they uh, planned for a direct uh, surgical intervention. Seeing that this was a, a cystic lesion, we had two options available. One is excision of the lesion and the other one was to marsupialize it. Again, the pediatrician here told me that they had done a marsupialization of similar kind of cysts in previously and they had a little bitter experience that it was, they, uh, they noticed a recurrence and he insisted that, that if we could remove the cystic lesion in total it would be nice. 
So uh, this was the child for whom we were uh, planning for the excision. And this is how the lesion appeared as soon as we put the tongue blade in. So here we had uh, many options available. One is by regular traditional surgical tools, that is the cold instrument. The other option available obviously is your monopolar and the bipolar cartridge. But as you know that both develop, I mean, in one tool, that is the cold instrument, you can get a lot more bleeding because you can see very well that it is attached to the tongue here. On the other hand, if you use the uh, uh, monopolar or bipolar, there will be a lot more thermal damage and this is a day old child and we don't know the anatomy of the lingual artery and the hypoglossal now. And that is the reason we chose the use of coblation here. So here you can see that we intubated the child with the nasotracheal intubation and with the regular Macintosh laryngoscope and with the coblator in one hand and endoscope in other hand and my assistant is holding that mouth uh, Macintosh laryngoscope. I am using with one, end, one hand the endoscope and in other hand the coblator and we are trying to use the coblator device. You can see that as I'm applying the coblator device, I'm leaving a one millimeter space between the lesion and the coblator wand. This is very, very important thing. The reason is you need the plasma interface for the coblation to work. Only if there is a millimeter uh, gap between the wand and the tissue, the ablation procedure will work. But whenever I wanted to get into the plane of the muscle, then I can use the touch mode or the contact mode. When we go into the contact mode, there will be more of thermal damage and more of cutting uh, uh, technique that will happen. So if you want the ablation to happen, you need to go in a near contact mode. So you can see that in between, I'm stopping my surgery and I'm trying to use my regular tissue forceps to dissect. And then once again, once I know for sure where my plane is, and once again, I'm starting to use my coblation wand. So now I can see the attachment to the lateral pharyngeal wall. And once again, I'm reorienting with my uh, endoscope and I am trying to identify the pedicle there. And then, I'm trying to resect the entire specimen in toto. This is, as you can see very clearly that this is a one day old child wherein we are able to insert the Macintosh laryngoscope and we were able to do the entire procedure without much of bleeding. And it is not a marsupialization. And here you can see the entire bed, which is completely devoid of blood. And this child was doing phenomenally well we were able to extubate the child the very next day and the child was doing fine without any respiratory distress. So that is the first case scenario that I wanted to show how we use the coblation and how it works. The second interesting case that I wanted to show is again a pediatric child. This child was one and a half year old wherein there was a lesion in the nasal cavity like which is increasing in size we thought that it could be an infantile hemangioma and the pediatrician started on propranolol. But the uh, child did not respond to propranolol. And then we went ahead and we did the uh, imaging. And then we even tried uh, uh, injection of steroid. This is a, a point where we have injected the steroid. And still we uh, followed up the child and the size was increasing and the deformity was worsening. You can see compared to the other alanazide, this ala was widened, it, it was increasing in size. So uh, after the discussion with the pediatrician and the pediatric surgeon, we went ahead with the surgery. Uh, traditionally, we went ahead with the regular uh, cold instruments and the use of monopolar and bipolar. As you can see in this picture, there was a lot of uh, blood staining over the surface of the lesion, but then, the dissection to achieve that level itself took up at most a half an hour. At this point, actually on the same day, we had an adenotonsil for another child and we, we had already completed the procedure for that child. 
at this point we were uh, my assistant was saying sir can we use the coblator and see how it works and uh, i was thinking that why oh, can't it be a, uh, uh, it was not a bad idea and i started using the coblator on this particular lesion i was worried initially whether i would not get a plane and i was also little skeptical about the bleeding and uh, avoiding the wounds especially it being a vascular mass it was a lobular capillary hemangioma but you can see here on the contrary that uh, uh, on contrary you get a beautiful plane completely a vascular plane where we were able to separate the lesion completely out from the rest of the adjacent tissues and we were able to separate this vascular neoplasm of the bed from which it was arising and we were able to separate it from the dermis of the skin as well we were able to separate it from the nasal bones we were able to separate it from the nasal labial uh, tissues and the rest of the entire procedure took only half an hour the first exposure took half an hour and the rest entire procedure took another half an hour it was a bloodless field wherein we were able to remove the lesion in total without further scarring and you can see that immediately on day 7 the child was doing well and we were following this child for more than a year and this child was doing fine phenomenally so that made us realize that this tool is actually a beautiful tool for addressing the vascular uh, malformations the next interesting scenario that i am going to show is a lesion in the nasopharynx this was a smooth cystic lesion in the nasopharynx that is nothing other than the thornwald uh, cyst or a thornwald abscess however you want to call it or an infected thornwald cyst you could call it so uh, this patient was an adult patient once again after uh, talking to the patient we spoke to him in detail that uh, we are planning to go for marsupialization and as we discussed we marsupialized the lesion and i think you would have noticed here we entered into this cystic lesion this is the thornwall cyst we suctioned out the entire uh, infected material from the cystic lesion and now you can see that we have decompress the entire cystic lesion and we started to um open up the cystic lesion marsupialize it but then we found that this was adherent to the adenoid tissue as you all know that adult adenoid tissue because of recurrent infection and repeated uh, infection it goes for fibrosis unlike the pediatric adenoid tissue it would need lot more ablation so here you can see that we are doing lot more ablation this is a precise wand wherein this is a precise easy view wand wherein we are using the precise wand easy view so to ablate the rest of the adenoid tissue as well as as you can see as we are going towards the buccopharyngeal fascia we are even ablating it completely so that it will not recur and we are also coagulating the posterior pharyngeal uh, wall so that there will not be any residue of the uh, mucosa or the epithelium of the thornwall abscess and it was a complete job so we completed the entire procedure like this and we followed the patient and he was devoid of any problem post operatively so this is the third instance apart from adenoid and tonsils we found it to be very useful the next instances we saw it to be useful is very many vascular malformations and hemangiomas in the oral cavity i am about to show you an interesting uh, lesion that was involving the uh, mid tongue and the posterior tongue base this is a adult patient who came to us with the history of choking and even symptoms of uh, obstructive sleep apnea because of this static mass arising from the mid tongue base which was contrast enhancing partially and it was uh, uh, um, growing backwards and it was obstructing the air passage especially at the night 
So uh, after the imaging that I had shown you before, we went ahead and we did a, a fine needle aspiration and it came out to be a neurogenic tumor. And after discussion and consent, we went ahead with the transoral route for the surgical excision. So here we thought of using the coblator as well as the other tools that is the monopolar and bipolar as well. So here first what we did, we used the Jennings mouth gag, we pulled the tongue outside and we used the stitch to pull it outside and then we used the coblator to make an incision in the midline. We used initially the coblator and then we thought why not we use the uh, knife itself so that uh, if there is, if the uh, vessels or the nerve is close by, it will not transmit the, any electrical energy. So we, we went ahead with the old knife here and we elevated in layers and we used alternatively monopolar as well as the coblator. And as soon as we went to the capsule, we went ahead with the either use of the bipolar or we use the coblator. So if we saw a big vessel there, we used a bipolar. And if we saw a medium sized vessel, we used a coblator. So meticulously, we started to create a plane and we used even a finger dissection. The reason is two things. We wanted to palpate the lingual artery and we also wanted to create a plane with it. So with the once we palpated that the lingual artery was medial and medial to the swelling, we started doing further dissection. And for this dissection, and you can see that there is a lot of mid-sized uh, capillaries over this lesion, we use the coblator over this tool to achieve a complete hemostasis. So meticulously, we did this over and over again over the lesion, and we were able to separate uh, this lesion completely from the tongue tissue. You can see that it is a well capsulated lesion and we were able to remove it. And the most important tool uh, use of this coblator is to achieve the complete hemostasis, especially from the uh, profunda lingual artery that was a branch from the lingual artery. And we were able to control uh, the hemostasis with the coagulation mode. Previously, I showed the ablation mode, but here, I'm showing you the use of the coagulation mode. Uh, the beneficial effect of this co coagulation over the bipolar is because the hypoglossal nerve is very close in proximity to the uh, profunda vessels there, the coagulation of, um, effect will not transmit that much of a heat energy. And you can also see that at the end of the excision, you can see that uh, the, uh, the entire airway was opened up and you can see how uh, uh, it is a near bloodless field. And this came out to be a schwannoma. And that completed the procedure. And uh, the patient was doing fine in the postoperative period. So now coming to the next uh, uh, lesion, this is uh, again a vascular malformation. Uh, once again, arising from the lower end of the eustachian tube orifice. And it was extending down to the velopharynx, to the oropharynx, and extending down to the hypopharynx. This patient had a history of hemoptysis. Whenever the patient took some uh, hot food or a, a sharp food, he would get profuse bleeding. And that is how he came to us. And it, as you can see, at, as it was extending down to the hypopharynx, pushing uh, the epiglottis, he also had this kind of a choking sensation. and. Uh, once again, uh, since we thought that it was a vascular malformation after imaging, we went ahead with the coblation assisted excision. The first and foremost thing we did is we tried to identify uh, the uh, root or the origin of this lesion that was arising from the nasopharynx or the velopharynx. We used uh, the use of the endoscope and we separated the lesion from the nasopharynx. And then we made an extended incision over the soft palate as we had shown you. We divided the palatoglossal arch and therein we can see the attachment of this lesion that was going to the lateral pharyngeal wall. You can very well see the uh, venous sinusoids that was attaching 
this lesion to the lateral pharyngeal wall and this is the beautiful use of the coagulation uh, uh, wherein you can precisely ablate as well as the coagulate the venous sinusoids whenever you get into this venous sinusoids you can use the contact mode with the coagulation that you can see how i am applying the coagulation uh, you, uh, as genius was mentioning we have to do uh, the pressing of the pedal in an alternative manner you cannot continuously press you have to go with the uh, contact mode and then press the blue button whenever you are doing the coagulation but when you want to ablate it you have to separate this tissue from the la lateral pharyngeal wall you go with the yellow pedal and you try to use the ablation but whenever you come across the bleeding like what i uh, shown you you go with the coagulation wand and if you want to see the plane very clearly it is a prudent advice for for you to keep a, a, a sponge holding for a sponge in that uh, area and uh, once the bleeding stops you can re examine it and with the help of the coagulator uh, co you can excise this completely from the lateral pharyngeal wall it came out to be a venous malformation and you can see that the attachment site is completely devoid of any bleeding this patient did phenomenally well in the post operative period and uh, that completes the procedure so the next procedure that i wanted to show is a lingual thyroid again in a pediatric age group this child presented to me again with the obstructive episodes especially at the night and uh, uh, we did uh, a examination this child had a midline tongue swelling that was pushing the epiglottis backwards and we did an imaging both a contrast imaging and it appeared to be arising from the midline of the dorsum midline so uh, we had the differential diagnosis of lingual thyroid and hence we got a medical endocrinologist opinion who did a nuclear imaging and then he gave us a go ahead for the surgical excision because the child was getting respiratory distress so our plan was to excise this lesion again using the coagulator and again using a trans oral approach without making any external incision so the traditional approach for this kind of incision is to go with the trans cervical approach but here what we did we did a nasotracheal intubation and we used this jennings mouth gag and we made a stitch over the tongue and we pulled the tongue outside and with a 45 degree endoscope we were able to visualize this lesion and on the other hand we are holding the coagulator and with the gentle application of the coagulation we were able to get a plane between the lesion and the tongue musculature this was our uh, one of the initial patients so we wanted to be sure uh, if we were away from the uh, lingual artery so we used the intraoperative uh, doppler and we make sure that it we were away from the lingual vessel the next important thing we wanted to do is we wanted to have a principle of traction and counter traction for any surgery we need a traction and counter traction for this we started doing we we went ahead and left a little bit of tongue chunk attached to the lesion thereby we were able to use an alice forceps and with the alice forceps we were able to do the retraction and in one hand i was able to do the traction and with the other hand we were able to do the counter traction and my assistant is showing the view with the 45 degree endoscope and then i will be using both the traction and counter traction that the traction which is held with the alice forceps on one hand and with the other hand the coagulator wand itself i am using it with the bent surface i am using it as a counter traction and i am trying to go all around you can see that now i am going to the median glosso epiglottic ligament and i am trying to ablate it and then i am going over the epiglottic a valicular surface of the epiglottis then i go to the lateral glosso epiglottic ligament and then to the lateral tongue base and then i am trying to excise the entire tongue base in along with the lesion in one go 
and this is the tongue base that appears after your excision and this is the day one itself you can see that the child is doing fine we did not keep the patient intubated we were we extubated on table and this child was um, doing phenomenally well in the day one itself and we did a post operative endoscopy in day 2 i think i'll show you the endoscopy this is the endoscopy on the day one you can see that there is some edema and we followed this child serially on day 7 and then on day um, 30 this is the post op day one month you can see how beautifully a good scarring has been uh, achieved and uh, this child was sent back to the medical endo endocrinologist to uh, restart the hormonal supplementation for the thyroxin and this child had no other uh, episode of uh, either snoring or choking post operatively so now uh, this is another patient uh, again with the uh, oropharyngeal mass this time it happened to arise from the lateral pharyngeal wall that too from the tonsillar fossa and obviously uh, lymphoma was suspected to be one of the differential diagnosis and hence we did a contrast ct so you can see that uh, it is uh, not that much contrast enhancing and you can see that uh, the lesion uh, is arising from the lateral pharyngeal wall and after uh, explaining the uh, uh, the pathology to the patient we we did a flexible fiber optic uh, guided intubation as this mass was extending all the way to the hypopharynx and it was pushing the epiglottis downwards so we used the endoscopic guided intubation i was able to insert the flexible uh, endoscope into the airway and my anesthetist inserted the endotracheal tube this was done with the transnasal approach and then we started doing the uh, uh, surgical procedure again the patient was kept in the rose position and we were able to see the lesions extent with the help of a uh, uh, evac 70 wand like we do for tonsillectomy we tried to get into the plane we went into the uh, uh, plane similar to the tonsillectomy whenever we get the bleeding see uh, unlike tonsillect uh, tonsils this uh, uh, lymphoma or any neoplastic lesion will have lot more blood supply so you may need to use the coagulation uh, uh, more than what we usually use for your traditional tonsillectomy so that is why you get a lot more black spots that you see in comparison to your tonsillar uh, tonsillectomy so you need to identify the entire uh, extent of the lesion and uh, if the tonsillar artery uh, comes in the way we were planning to ligate it but since did it, it did not come into the way we just ablated the uh, um, the venous uh, blood supply that came in for the lesion and we were able to excise the lesion in toto we excised the lesion and we achieved a complete hemostasis this is the lesion that was removed and it uh, came out again as lymphoma you can see the paratonsillar vein that is seen in the bed and uh, you can see the fossa that is uh, clear without any bleeding and uh, you can see that in the this is the specimen and this is the post operative uh, healing how the fossa heals so similarly we have uh, two other patients since i had shown the uh, pediatric uh, lingual thyroid i'll just show that this kind of uh, tissue can also occur in the adult and this can also cause a secondary epiglottic uh, collapse and we do use the coblator once again to achieve a uh, complete uh, hemostasis and we mark the uh, incision site and we 
go ahead and we use the coblation itself to get a plane between the uh, tongue musculature and the lesion we leave enough of tongue chunk attached to the uh, specimen so that we can do a, both of a counter traction and uh, as well as we get the adequate margin just in case if it is uh, uh, belonging to any neoplasm but uh, because we had evaluated before itself it again came out as uh, adult lingual thyroid you can see the serious wise endoscopies uh, that shows how beautifully it heals and for this patient we kept the patient uh, overnight intubation and we did a flexible metallic uh, we did a flexible endoscopy on the post operative day 1 to see if there is no bleeding and then we extubated the patient and this again another uh, neoplasm this actually was a uh, low grade uh, mucoepidermoid carcinoma and we were able to do the similar procedure that i had told with the adequate margin and this was the this patient we did a pre op uh, tracheostomy and uh, we also sent the specimen for frozen to make sure that uh, the margins were adequate and uh, this patient was followed up post operatively and this patient was also sent for an oncologist uh, for uh, his opinion post operatively and was doing fine in the post operative phase finally this is the uh, uh, this is a, another patient with the severe respiratory distress again on day 1 when we were called in to evaluate there was a two lesion one is the cystic lesion and the other problem is the severe laryngomalacia so you can see a very classical laryngomalacia wherein the epiglottis gets sucked in during the respiration and you can also see this cystic lesion in the tongue base so again uh, i just wanted to show how we put the tongue stitch for this patient therein we will not be able to insert even our regular tonsil mouth gag we used to put this uh, mouth gag the jennings mouth gag and we do kind of like a repose suture therein we go in through the tongue base and then we get this stitch out and then we pull the tongue base tongue uh, base out so once we get the tongue uh, tissue out now we have this uh, assistant who holds the tongue tissue with the the suture this is an unedited video we can see how this tongue tissue collapses in and you can see that there is hardly any space this is a day one child once again but you can see that with the coblator we are creating a plane between the lesion and the normal tongue tissue so that we can actually get hold with our alice forceps so that we can have a traction and a counter traction so that we can get into the tongue base musculature with the coblator itself so this is one of the beautiful use of the coblator which is uh, the best use of the coblator is in the tongue base uh, wherein we can totally avoid any uh, open approach and we can see that it it gives a, a complete hemostatic field and thereby it is also giving a, a field wherein there is a, a very less thermal damage and we can see that we are able to go around the lesion you can see that how i am using the coblator wand and the endoscope and the retractor and the coblator all in in the day one child and we can see how we with the help of the coblator we are able to go into the tongue base and we are able to go all around the lesion like this and we are able to excise the lesion in toto that is the beauty of this tool so we were able to excise this lesion in toto without causing any thermal damage to this child we were also able to show you see that the entire vallecula and the tongue base is completely devoid of any bleeding 
and you can see how beautifully we have uh, we are achieving a hemostasis with the help of the coagulator with the coagulation wand and we kept the child overnight intubated and on day 1 we examined this child to see that there is no bleeding no edema and then we removed we we did the we did the uh, uh, extubated the child this is the final case uh, stinovas this is the last case wherein there was a retropharyngeal mass that was pushing the epiglottis down and this lesion uh, was presenting into the oropharynx i mean uh, oral cavity and or or pharynx and again we try to do a transoral endoscopic uh, excision with the help of the coagulator as well as uh, use of the bipolar so here we are using once again the coagulator as a surface uh, coagulant to achieve coagulation over the small capillaries that are over the uh, lesion this is again a capsulated lesion wherein we are able to insert our artery forceps and get a good plane if we find a, a big vessel we obviously go for a bipolar and we divide and if there is any surface capillaries over the lesion we use the coagulator so we alternatively use the coagulator and bipolar and we achieved a good hemostasis and then once again with the help of finger dissection we try to uh, elevate the lesion from the lateral pharyngeal wall and we were able to excise the lesion in toto and at the end we inserted the endoscope to see the bed we can see that the site of origin was the vagus and we can see the pulsations uh, over the carotid also this is the pulsations i think you can notice the pulsations over the carotid we went with the transoral approach and we were able to excise the lesion in toto to make sure that we achieve a complete seal we did the closure in two layer muscular layer once and then the mucosal layer and then we irrigated the lesion with saline i mean the oropharynx with saline obviously this patient was tracheostomized and we made sure that there was a water tight seal and again it came out to be a ancient schwannoma and we decannulated the child in uh, day 3 and this is how the child is doing fine in day 7 the voice is fine the child was doing fine without any respiratory distress so in nutshell i wanted to show uh, Now show the application of the coagulator in various regions of uh, the nasopharynx, uh, nasal cavity, oropharynx, as well as in the external um, uh, dorsum uh, and in the retropharyngeal space. Its uh, use cannot be reiterated more than this in the pediatric age group. So that concludes my uh, topic for today. Astinuas, if you have any questions, um, I'll be happy to answer. Uh, I think uh, Harsha is going to take the questions, or do you want me to uh, take the questions? Uh, either one is fine, or All we right. can take the questions at the end also, because uh, yeah, you probably. can complete your talk, and then Harsha can take the questions, and uh, he can ask the question to you and me uh, yeah, after probably. your talk is completed. So yeah. right now it is only six fifty-five. So you have uh, one more hour well, left. Uh, so of which you can correct. So uh, so there were a couple of questions in terms of the wands, as you correctly said. Yeah. Uh, but I think we will uh, uh, do the. So it's up to Harsha whether he wants me to talk about the. See. Uh, yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Please. Or yes. uh, so what I will do is. Uh, i have a presentation which shows each wand and the kind of surgery it does that is one way of doing it the other way is let me finish off my presentation yes. and if time permits we can go back to introduction of the wands yes. otherwise i am happy to make the entire presentation in a pdf format and pass it on to you so that um, uh, you can send it to uh, whoever is asked for it sir you have is that sure. okay harsha you have time sir you can go ahead sir yeah 
we have okay. a lot of time uh, students you can finish off your scheduled uh, presentation first okay. and then we will take the questions and the uh, other wand uh, if needed all right so okay let's just let me just uh, Mm. One second. Okay, do you see my screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do see it. Okay. Uh, hello, friends. Um, so, after uh, scintillating presentation of videos and talk by Sagar, it's always a difficult job to play the second fiddle. But uh, I'll try to do my best. Our aim uh, today to talk to you all is about introducing to the other. Uh, roles of uh, cobblation technology other than doing it for adenotonsillectomy. And I'm sure all of you must have gone through um, adenotonsillectomies uh, and how you do it and, uh, you know, different tips and tricks. So, uh, after uh, Sagas Papori, I'm going to start off with um, the role of cobblation uh, in rhinology and skull base. Now, why is cobblation very important in small cavities? Now, if you can see, this is a video of uh, uh, a sphenopalatine artery bleed. This is, uh, this, is, uh, this is a call that most of us get from the emergency room. Uh, are you able to see the video? Hello? Uh, yes, Srinivas, very nice and clear. Okay, fine. So, uh, so the reason why and uh, cobblation works in this kind of very small scenarios is that cobblation is actually a four in one weapon. It can ablate, it can coagulate, it can suck and it can irrigate. And these four functions can be beautifully demonstrated when you are actually trying to ablate the uh, bleeding from the sphenopalatine artery. As you can see here, uh, this is a 70-year-old patient on uh, Echosprin and who's been called, have been called for uh, intractable epistaxis. And we've been able to decently control the bleeding from this medium-sized blood vessel. So let me just play this again. This is a major vessel coming, uh, bleeding from here, which is a sphenopalatine vessel. So you put the coplation directly towards the opening of the, uh, uh, where the artery is opening. A point here that you need to note is the exit of the artery is along or parallel to the opening, the, the suction port. So what also happens is this tends to go into the suction port. The artery tends to go into the suction port. And no matter how many times you coagulate, it won't get coagulated. So the trick that you need to do at this point is to kink, your assistant should kink the suction a little bit so that the artery will come out of the suction port and then you can coagulate it. Now, when you coagulate it, you need to press a minimum of four seconds. It's not like how you use for your bipolar diathermy. It's not buzz and go, buzz and go you have to keep the pedal pressed for four seconds for your coagulation to work. So this is one place where I think coagulation works in, in one is to, uh, in, in, in four ways. So it not only helps you wash off the blood that's coming out from there, it sucks it so that you can identify where the vessel is coming from and locate it and coagulate it. Now, when we talk about improving nasal airflow, there are beautiful papers that are coming out which are slowly changing our concepts from attacking the inferior turbinate to where the actual airflow happens. 
I would like to seek your attention into this beautiful paper that's come out in 2015 by Chao. What they did was they took 22 healthy adults and they did computational fluid dynamic studies and they looked at where is actually the maximum airflow happening. And to your surprise, dear friends, the maximum percentage of airflow happens at the level of the middle meatus area and not at the inferior meatus area. What, of us, well, mo what most of us do is try to attack this area and forget much about this area. And that is why most of what we now call as functional nasal airway surgery concepts are coming in is to tackle the airflow in this particular area. These are, these are results from the same paper. Look at the subject wise, the amount of percentage of airflow through the olfactory cleft, the superior meatus, the middle and the inferior. Look at the amount of airflow going in through the middle meatus and compare it with what is happening in the inferior. No matter what, which subject you take, all of them majoritily are in the middle meatus area. And hence, managing the middle meatus in addition to the inferior meatus is very important. But inferior meatus, as you know, forms the area for the, uh, the anatomical nasal valve. Hence, we need to start working right from this area. So how does coblation work in this area? Because you are using a non-plasma wand, as you saw, you need to generate the plasma in the field and the evac 45 reflux uh, the reflux ultra 45 wand is not a plasma wand so you once you inject the tissue with the saline you enter into it plus the coagulate button enter into the tissue keep on pressing it and then after 15 seconds you try to withdraw at every single mark. Each one of these marks helps you to ablate the anterior, the middle, and the posterior one-third of the, uh, the turbinate. Now, how does this work, basically? The rationale behind using this technology is that histologically, it reduces the submucosal glands and reduces the venous sinusoids which form the basis for the increased size of the uh, inferior turbinate adding a turbinoplasty to all your adenoid hypertrophies will add a lot of value there is a lot of literature out there that basically tells you that adding an inferior turbinoplasty a very minimally invasive turbinoplasty like how you are doing into your adenoidectomies improves your quality of life post procedure uh, and increases subjective uh, satisfaction rates now if you really look at the different kinds of technologies that are out there to deal with inferior turbinate ablations here is a paper that compares inferior turbinate reduction coblation versus microdebrader and it's a nicely uh, done study prospective randomized trial please read the ones that i have underlined he, the submucosal coblation is as effective as microdebrider for inferior turbinate reduction. And since it's a randomized study, you need to take it. The side effects are minimal with both procedures, significant patient satisfaction rates postoperatively. Here is another paper from the European archives, managing inferior turbinate hypertrophy coblation versus radiofrequency. Here also they, they, they compare two different techniques, RF and coblation. Um, here they found that in both these techniques, even though in short term, the results have been great in terms of improving nasal airflow, the efficacy tends to decrease after age, uh, after three years. That means you can guarantee your patient three years. After three years, well, the results according to literature are not up to the mark and even for me uh, that is the uh, the same message that i would like to give here is another paper from the annals which basically 
comparing radio frequency coagulation versus intramural bipolar cautery for the treatment of inferior turbinate hypertrophy again suggesting the same thing seems to offer an equal alternative to bipolar uh, electrocautery for the treatment of inferior turbinate hypertrophy. So no matter uh, what technology you're using, I think this is a, a, a good take home message that coblation, importance of coblation in terms of improving airflow is good and it's backed by literature. This is, the, this is what I was talking to you all about when I'm talking about increasing airflow through the middle meatus. Now, this is something that most of us see. We call it the septal tubercle or the septal swell body. Um, there is again a lot of literature that is now coming up to tell us that you know septal swell bodies need to be addressed. This is a simple procedure that you can even do in the outpatient under local anesthesia. Um, here we are using a reflux uh, ultra 45 wand. Since reflux ultra 45 wand is not a uh, plasma wand, you need to inject the target tissue with saline. And once you do that, you can apply the reflux ultra 45 wand into the, uh, into the tissue and then ablate it for about 15 seconds. And slowly, this area would beautifully open up and subjective improvement in terms of airflow is beautiful for these patients. So it's high time we start looking at middle meatus airflow instead of just focusing on the inferior metal airflow. Now, why not use it for FES? Now, it is very important to understand when you're picking up a tool to do endoscopic sinus surgery um, that or any kind of a hot technique when you put it into the nose, you need to understand that, that the depth of penetration and the impact that is having on viable tissue. And in this case, uh, ciliated columnar epithelium. So it is very important to understand that when coblation is applied in this area, the, uh, uh, the damage that it can cause to the functional epithelium in the nose is pretty bad. How? Here is a paper that basically tells us that, number one, when you are using uh, coblation, the thermal damage to the epithelium and underlying seromucinous glands is devastating. And complete re-epithelialization occurs by day 29. But the seromucinous glands are replaced by fibrosis. And the epithelium is covered by squamous and not ciliated columnar epithelium. So the fibrotic and metaplastic effects caused by coblation suggest that it may be a better suited to areas such as turbinate instead of functional mucosa. And that is the reason why you should not use endoscopic uh, coblation in endoscopic sinus surgery. However, there are certain specific indications when you can use coblation. For example, let's look at this particular video. This is an isolated polyp coming from the sphenoid sinus. Okay, so this is a, a here I'm using an EVAC for uh, EVAC 70, which is the uh, workhorse according to me. So we're going into the uh, sphenoid sinus area and very beautifully see, this is a tissue, this is a uh, tool that can irrigate, coagulate and coblate. You can see the sphenoid ostium beautifully. And since you can actually look at it fiber by fiber, you can ablate the whole thing and then There is not a, a drop of blood that you can uh, see. So you use a mushroom forceps, clear it off. Then you can actually see where this is coming from. And that's where it was coming from and then you ablate that area. 
Now, in certain cases, especially patients with dental problems presenting with osteomyelitis, uh, this is a patient presenting with pain, malar pain. The patient went to a dentist. The dentist actually cleared off the uh, tooth and said that all is well, there is nothing left. The tooth has been removed, but the patient continued to have problems in terms of pain in the malar region. So as you can slowly see, as the middle meatus is being, uh, the, uh, the MMA is being widened by the debrider, you can actually see the, the mucosa inside the maxillary sinus. And then you can see a little bit of uh, uh, fungal outgrowths there. This whole thing is inflamed. So then what we do is I'm using a hydro debrider to basically debride the whole thing. This is the hydro debrider by Metronic. It's an excellent tool to flush out whatever is inside. The pressure that is generated is much higher than you would use uh, with any kind of a syringe. So once that is done, this is what you can see. And then you can start using your cublator. Now, what I want you to see is look at the kind of the cancellous bone that is happening. The most of you would have seen maxillary sinus would have done umpteen number of maxillary sinusotomies and look at the quality of the bone. This is not the quality of bone that you see if you're dealing with a normal uh, maxillary sinus. Are you able to see the porosity here? So in such patients, you would obviously not want to keep this mucosa because this is not functional mucosa, dear colleagues. This is diseased mucosa. The periosteum itself is completely involved and you would want to remove this mucosa and what best way to do than to do it with ablation. Now you can very clearly see, see the entire posterior wall of the maxilla is, is, uh, is very porous and um, it's completely diseased. And you can see the floor of the maxillary sinus and you see the quality of the bone there and you can see the quality of this bone. Trust me, it was so porous, it was not hard at all. Now, so the entire mucosa is cleared off. You can see this posterior medial portion was more affected than the lateral portion using a, a 70 degree scope to basically take a look at it. So I'm taking the cublator and clearing the uh, mucosa more and more to expose whatever porous uh, bone is left there. I'm just scraping it off. So now you can see that most of it is cleared. This is one month post-op. So put in some um, uh, gel foam with uh, antibiotic solution soaked in it. And this is post-op six months, exactly the same area. It beautifully uh, epithelializes and the uh, patient is absolutely symptom free. This is a limited inverted papilloma, uh, a Croyuse uh, uh, Croyus, uh, 2, uh, using the Croyuse classification. So here we're using the uh, cublation to basically uh, clear off the middle turbinate. Let me fast forward this. So since this is a tool that can cut, ablate and coagulate at the same time, this is a wonderful tool to use in the nose as well. But please don't use it for any kind of functional surgery. So it's not to be used for functional surgery. You can use this 
for uh, any kind of uh, uh, an ablative surgery for any kind of tumors. So I'm going towards the end and trying to cut off the, the middle terminate where the inverted papilloma seems to be arising from based on the uh, neo-osteogenesis that we uh, saw or hypertrophic thick bone that we saw on the CT. So once that is done, we have to do a classical medial maxillectomy. This is something which is very routine. We use the medially based flap and drill the whole thing, remove the medial wall as much as possible, cut the nasolacrimal duct sharp with a blade and use a burr, clear it off, flush the floor of the maxillary sinus, the floor of the uh, nose and and this is a complete medial maxillectomy and you rotate this flap that would help in uh, epithelialization or mucosalization of the uh, maxillary sinus to prevent excessive scar formation and crusting. Now Population in skull base, here is some literature that would say that. I would quote some literature and then I would show you the cases. Uh, it has been shown that coblacia-based tumor resections were associated with reduced blood loss. So when you use coblation, the blood loss is 350 ml as opposed to if you don't use coblation. And you would see visible improvements on the warm wall surgical scale, uh, field scale grade. And this is another paper that we basically also says that the average duration of a coblation assisted encephalocele removal was 15.8 minutes compared to 46 minutes compared to a standard bipolar technique. This is, this is literature that's out there, so you cannot ignore it. So one of the excellent tools that I, uh, the excellent indications is in, in, uh, in CSF, wherein I am using a 70 degree endoscope and I'm using the workhorse, which is the coblation EVAC 71. See, anyway, we would want the mucosa to go away so that your graft when you're using onlay would nicely stick. So that's the encephalo seal there. It's a small one, but your idea is to actually clear off all the, so the moment you use the coblation there, you would actually see that the encephalo seal just disappears as you can see it here. But the actual role of coblation comes here. See, there are bleeders that would come there. So if you use coblation there, keep it pressed for about four seconds, it would beautifully seal it up. So of course, this is a, a video that I fast forwarded. It's, it's running at uh, two plus, two X. And this is the area where there is a breach because all this is, this is the olfactory neuron, as you can see. And this whole area is the breach. So once you have this area and this whole area has been removed with coblation, now you can use any kind of a tool to, um, so when I'm using this in, uh, uh, in such an area where you would want the coblation to work against gravity, you would definitely need your uh, pressure bottle because uh, I would probably, if, if there is time, I will show you how we use the uh, pressure bottle. This is the frontal sinus area, basis area. This is one of the techniques wherein we have resected the middle turbinate. There are now techniques wherein you can use the middle turbinate, you can use Duragen to actually uh, close such grafts, uh, such leaks, but that's another discussion for another time. Now, as an adjunct in endoscopic endonasal transphenoid surgeries, 
So not as a standalone tool, like Sagar beautifully showed how he would use bipolar, monopolar. So I'm, in, I'm introducing you to the video wherein we've sort of try, we've exposed the rostrum of this phenoid. Okay, this is the rostrum of this phenoid. This is the sphenoid natural os. So now, this is what I want you to see. See how the plasma is actually, you're using the plasma to take care of the vessels? This, it does beautifully. See, this, one, so this is the cella. This is the plas use of plasma to actually, so I'll let this run. So I'm holding the wand down and I'm letting the plasma go and clear off the, uh, and coagulate the uh, vessels there. So the settings when we are using this is a regular seven and three, and nowhere I'm using the blue pedal. All I'm doing is using the uh, yellow pedal to clear off the, So let this play a little bit. So the idea is for you to understand how to apply this technology. And, and that's why I'll just, uh, this is the Hadad that we harvested. So this is the regular stuff wherein you're just using the burr to sort of uh, flush the rostrum uh, and rest everything else is same. But the way your cublation wand can actually give you that field in that area, that is uh, where I want you all to, uh, this everything else is the same. Now, this is an East Tisho, a Kadesh Morita stage three. This is a huge uh, lesion, almost, uh, this is the uh, mucocutaneous junction. This is a huge East Tisho. So initially started off by trying to ablate the uh, vessels on top of the tumor. The moment we started touching it, started bleeding. So because there was no space even for me to take a modified Denker's uh, lesion, so I decided to debulk it a little bit. I'm using a regular um, mono, I mean, uh, EVAC 71. With this in my hand, I feel very confident. So now you can see, now we can see the anterior end of the inferior turbinate. So now I know I'm using uh, uh, a, monopo uh, a monopolar radio frequency to make my incision for the, um, for the modified Dunker's approach. And once I've done that, I would again use my cublator to sort of clear off all that oozing that would come from that area. So now I'm using the ProSize Max one. If you saw the difference between that and this, the irrigation here comes from above. So this is the margin of the piriform. So now we're slowly making the, so this is the maxillary sinus. And now you can see the lesion in the maxillary sinus.
So this is the lesion. This is the margin of the piriform. You can see the pulsatile uh, uh, tumor there, the East tissue. So now I, I go about debulking it. This is, once you have the right tool in hand, any lesion is doable, any lesion. All you need to do is have good access, good control, and with this beautiful tool, see how I'm able to clear off the entire and debulk the whole thing. This is um, so now we're slowly going in. So this is a so look at the aggression with which this wand can is actually eating up that tissue. Yes, it is causing a little bit of damage, but so now slowly. We could actually see this is the maxillary sinus if you are able to uh, appreciate. Now we're slowly able to. This is the shell of the region. So I'm trying to core it from within so that the whole thing would slowly fall back and collapse on itself. This is the view from the maxillary sinus. This is the nostril. And slowly hinging on the bone there, I'm slowly elevating the tumor. Quite an aggressive tumor there. Now that I've cleared the lower portion quite a bit, now I'm trying to attack the upper portion. And this is the upper portion. Now this is the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. Now this is where we need to be very careful. Uh, Harsha, Sagar, are you able to see? Are you audible? Yes, very loud and clear. Yeah, okay. So, this is the mucosa of the medial wall. This is the uh, medial wall of the bony medial wall of the maxilla, which I've taken down. This is the lesion. So with... So I wanted more of this... Uh, Exposure, so we're trying to clear this off. So now you can see this is the sphenopalatine, I mean, area. This is the tumor there. There's a little bit of oozing coming from the medial aspect of the maxillary sinus. And this is the tumor again, which I slowly ablate, co coagulate, ablate, coagulate, ablate. So slowly I'm trying to sigh and see if, the, uh, if I can reach one more landmark of mine. One landmark I've reached there is the posterior coana. The other landmark that I'm trying to look for is the sphenoid os. So I'm trying to uh, sort of clear the tumor there and reach that maxillary os, I mean the sphenoid os. See now, slowly I'm trying to reach this finite os area. This is the posterior quena. This 
This is the roof of the nose. This, the moment I reach this, this is the sphenoid os. So this was the landmark that I was looking for, posterior quana and sphenoid os. These are all inspissated secretions that are got trapped inside the sphenoid sinus because of the, the lesion. So now I had my landmarks very clear, posterior quana, I have my sphenoid os. Now I can go and ablate this whole thing layer by layer, layer by layer, because I know that I have this wonderful tool in my hand. This whole thing is still the tumor. So I'm now I've cleared this whole tumor in that area. This was actually involving the orbit as well. So this is, I'm using the cublation on the periorbiter. Since this is a, a, a rod-like device, you can change any direction that you would want. This is the, um, the roof of the ethmoid. Fortunately, it was not, uh, so I'm able to clearly peel off from the skull base. Gently pushing the whole thing posteriorly and medially. Just looking for if there are any beaches. And now this is the rest of the tumor here. Again, I use my cublation wand. Slowly, gently pushing it, nudging it, trying to push it medially. And here, if you see, I'm using the back of my wand to cauterize this area. And since its irrigation is there, this helps to wash off any blood. And that is what I want you all to observe, that this helps you to wash it off as I'm peeling it off the posterior wall, uh, the posterior medial wall of the maxilla. It's gone in the orbit, abutting the periorbiter. I'm clearing it off layer by layer. This is the roof of the maxillary sinus. Obviously, there is no roof because the tumor has completely removed it. This is the inflamed normal maxillary sinus mucosa. Now this is the uh, trying to coagulate the septal branch because I would know that the septal branch is there of the This is the sphenoid, this is the cella. 
this is the carotid, this is the skull base, this is the posterior coena. So this is, I'm just going on to the opposite side to see if there's any kind of a tumor there. And uh, that's how we sort of cleared the entire lesion. Now, in conclusion, cobletion is a low frequency, uh, radio frequency ablation tool, which is gaining favor in rhinology and skull base, as I just showed you. The potential benefits are it reduces intraoperative bleeding, as I've shown you in the literature. It improves endoscopic visualization. Since it's a very gentle device, it reduces pain. All these three points reduce operating time. The only drawbacks are the, the cost that is involved in buying the wand, and it absolutely is contraindicated in, uh, on uh, functional mucosa. So you're not supposed to use it for functional endoscopic sinus surgery. So in my view, the potential benefits definitely outweigh the costs. Don't just this. Don't try to make money on the cobulation wand. Don't. Uh, and this is just because I'm saying this because uh, it's uh, it's only us. Try to sell the result and not the product. This is what I believe. So your product is your is Popeye with strength. Don't try to sell the spinach which makes Popeye strong. Sell the strong Popeye and your product will be automatically paid for. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, sir. Uh, Srinivas Kishar, sir, for excellent uh, demonstration of uh, your surgical videos uh, with cobulation. Uh, we have a few questions, sir. OK. Uh, when you are doing the inferior turbinoplasty, mm -hmm. I have a few questions. Uh, uh, where, uh, sir. Can you use a RF in place of this cobulation wand in middle turbinate? Yes, you can. Definitely you can. I use both. You can use cobulation wand, you can use uh, RF. Uh, but to me, in adults, RF is better. In kids, cobulation is better. That's my take. There were a lot of questions on asking. People were asking on to show the cobulation ablation settings and how do you connect the cobulation? Uh, what I will do, uh, Harsha, is tomorrow, the moment I go to the hospital, I will take pictures of uh, all those settings. Um, I have an entire presentation on each of the wand and what the settings are and what, uh, what all surgeries each wand can do. Yes. Since you are already running, we are still already running late and it's 7.41 and since you already have another presentation, yeah. I think probably next time I can, uh, uh, me and Sagar, both of us can come down with those uh, answers. We'll take first 10 minutes to answer these questions and meanwhile, I, def I promise you I'll send you the PDFs for it. And, um, uh, and whatever. the next talk, I think we can do that, uh, right, Srinivas? Yes, we can do. Make the wants is a separate presentation that yes. I have. Maybe we can uh, do it for first 15 can, minutes. For first 10-15 uh, minutes, we can we share can it that. between and ourselves we'll and do it. Yeah. Absolutely. We'll do that. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Vidya Sagar, sir, uh, there were few Hi. Things, uh, when you were uh, presenting your uh, uh, lingual thyroid. Yes. Oh, sorry, I just uh, lost the questions. Let me stop sharing here. If you found that the lingual thyroid is the only functioning thyroid, then how will you proceed in that case? And <clears throat> the question was, how deep is the lingual artery at the base of the tongue? Excellent, excellent question. So first I'll answer the second part and then I'll go to the first part. The second part is how uh, the relation between the lingual artery and uh, the lingual thyroid. So we do obviously an imaging contrast CT as well as we do a um, ultrasound also, Doppler also. So with the CT, we will get an idea where the lesion is located and where the lingual artery is located also. And with the Doppler also we will know how far 
the lingual artery is being pushed by the tumor so um, and intraoperatively at least in our first few cases we use the uh, doppler probe to mark the course of the lingual artery thereby as we move the wand closer to the lingual artery we can see both the wand also can be seen as well as the lingual artery can also be seen so we have a guide uh, to go ahead uh, this and for the second part for the first part we always get a medical endocrinologist involved whenever we are dealing with the lingual thyroid so obviously uh, we will uh, do an ultrasound neck we will make sure if there is any uh, normal thyroid is present or not and on the other hand if the patient is not having a thyroid and if the uh, lingual thyroid is the only functioning thyroid then we will have a discussion with the parents both myself as well as the medical endocrinologist and we will outweigh the symptom versus the problem so if this is the only functioning thyroid if uh, the patient does not have that much of a problem because of this lesion then we will make sure if the functioning thyroid and the, the normal hormonal levels are in normal range then we will see if we, we would not remove the thyroid lesion on the contrary if the patient is already hypothyroid and if the patient is always uh, obviously having symptoms of uh, either choking or uh, dysphagia or uh, oas symptoms then uh, this can also cause secondary epiglottic collapse also so then these are the instances we will have a good counseling with the patient's family and uh, in concurrence with the, the medical end endocrinologist we do a complete excision and post operatively we have to make sure that the patient goes back to medical endocrinologist for the accurate hormonal supplementation so this is how we work in our uh, department do you does it answer yes sir do you yeah. use ultrasound intraoperatively yes ultrasound doppler yes for the first three cases we were using it but then we were able to identify that this lesion obviously pushes the normal lingual thyroid laterally i mean lingual artery laterally so you are taking only 0.5 mm uh, uh, 5 mm of normal tongue tissue as a cuff to hold on the rest you are leaving behind so in no way we are going closer to the lingual artery provided the lingual artery is not closer to the lesion in the first go you got it what i'm saying sri harsha okay, okay. so obviously in our first few cases we were using the ultrasound and doppler uh, for guiding us whether we are going closer to the uh, lingual artery sir uh, dr srinivas kishor sir mm -hmm. regarding your uh, uh esthesia there's a comment uh, from ba dr balakrishnan yes i have answered that uh, for him okay sir fine sir. yeah uh, then i think that answers uh, most of the questions today sure sure uh, surely me sometime in the, uh, we'll we'll be discussing date the speakers yes and uh, we'll be uh, uh, doing with uh, most of uh, the technical aspects of coblation uh, sometime uh, in the next webinar definitely harshan thank you very much for all the effort and uh, thanks for being patient thank you sir dr vidya sagar sir Shri... yes sir thank you shriya sir thank you so much for doing this i know how much of pain you are taking and you are doing this in dissipation of the knowledge to the entire ent fraternity i also thank the audience uh, for having their patience to go through the entire two hours to sit with us and uh, understand uh, the concepts of coblation in ent yes we are going to come back with the part 2 wherein we will be detailing its use in osa as well as in larynx so uh, and also uh, the basics of uh, wands so with this i want to thank the opportunity uh, i want to thank my co faculty dr srinivas kishore for an excellent excellent uh, presentation i really enjoyed his uh, videos wherein uh, the use of coblation is shown in uh, skull base and rhinology uh, thank you so much thank you all thank you all okay. thank you bye